I think uh, every speaker is here now, so if I may, I would like to begin. Um, Dobriden, is, this is the word, <laughs> only word I know. My name is uh, Sanghyun Song, I'm a judge, as well as the president of the International Criminal Court, also known as the ICC. It is a distinct honor for me to chair this panel session entitled International Crime, National and International Jurisdictions. On behalf of the ICC, I would like to offer my sincere gratitude to the Russian Ministry of Justice for organizing this impressive forum and for inviting me to participate. It is a particular pleasure to do so in the presence of <clears throat> many distinguished um, senior officials uh, from many of the ICC's 122 states parties as well as uh, many other states. Certainly the topic of this session is very broad and the distinguished panelists will no doubt address many different aspects of it on the basis of their particular expertise. Uh, but before I give them uh, the floor, I would like to make a, just a few uh, brief uh, comments of my own. Let me start by going back in time. When I was eight years old, a war broke out in my own country, Korea. It was a cruel and brutal war for millions of civilians. My family lived in Seoul. It was a city which changed hands a couple of times during the war. For three months, my family had to hide in a hot and humid underground bunker as the city was being destroyed and thousands were being killed just a few feet above my head. It was my job to leave the bunker every day to find and collect anything that was edible. Uh, wherever I could. I, would have, I had to walk 10, 20 kilometers every day, and I saw hundreds of the dead uh, bodies. It was summer, and those days were long and hot. There can be no way to forget the sickening smell of bodies left to de decompose where they fell fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, sons, and daughters, their bodies crowded the street. I believe many Russians of my generation uh, have uh, similar painful memories as this nation suffered enormously uh, in the Second World War. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I'm convinced that international law can play a crucial role in the global efforts to spare future generations of the horrors of war. The criminalization of the most horrendous acts known to humanity is obviously a fundamentally important step in that direction. The Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, together with the accompanying legal text, especially the elements of crimes, represents the most comprehensive codification of core international crimes 
thus far. As you are aware, the Rome Statute was adopted in 1998 as the final results of a long process that started in Nuremberg and was carried out by the International Law Commission and culminated in three years of multilateral negotiations under the auspices of the United Nations. The Rome Statute entered into force in 2002, and today it has 122 states parties. But we all know that mere codification is not enough for laws to make a difference. They need to be implemented and enforced. Indeed, enforcement has always been one of the most challenging aspects of international criminal law. How can we transform treaty provisions into accountability, justice, and deterrence? Here, a critical question is the relationship and roles of international and national jurisdictions in the prosecution of international crimes. Russia's permanent representative to the United Nations, Ambassador Vitaly Churkin, recently addressed this particular matter in a public statement. He said that a key principle of the International Criminal Court is the complementarity of the ICC's jurisdiction with national jurisdictions. And Ambassador Churkin stated that this is undoubtedly the ICC's strong side. I fully agree with that assessment. The strength of the International Criminal Court lies indeed in the fact that it is not just the lone court on its own trying to make a difference. Rather, the Rome Statute has given rise to an entire international justice system, a new kind of justice paradigm that is emerging and evolving. You see, under the Rome Statute, the national jurisdictions of all states exercise primary jurisdiction for genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes, while the ICC is a uh, fail-safe mechanism, a court of last resort designed to prevent impunity if all else fails. We can therefore say that the Rome Statute system consists of two levels that supplement or complement each other. And I stress that the national jurisdictions have the primary right and primary obligation to investigate and prosecute any alleged ICC crimes occurring on their territory. As a matter of law, the ICC has to step back if a competent national jurisdiction 
is generally investigating or prosecuting the allegations in question. National jurisdictions also play a crucial role in the context of the ICC's proceedings since the ICC relies entirely on states when it comes to the enforcement of judicial decisions and orders. You know, ICC has no police force of its own. The Rome Statute community of states is devoting strong attention to the strengthening of national jurisdictions in accordance with the principle of complementarity. This is one of the most important topics discussed at the Assembly of States Parties to the Rome Statute not only at the annual sessions, but also in, the, in, in working groups and the various events throughout the year. States have recognized time and again that in order to end the impunity, national jurisdictions must have the capacity to investigate and prosecute Rome statute crimes. In practice, this requires an adequate legal framework, an independent and competent judiciary, and necessary technical resources and skills. Technical assistance of international and regional organizations as well as other states, is often crucial for building these capacities, especially in countries emerging from conflict. Here we see a strong connection between the goals of the Rome Statute system and the broader international rule of law and development community. Indeed, I believe that the United Nations is a primary forum for international cooperation for the strengthening of the rule of law globally. But also, within the Rome Statutes Assembly of States parties, New forums and mechanisms have been created to facilitate, to facilitate technical assistance and cooperation. I'm also very glad to note that the ICC has concluded cooperation agreements with the, the organization Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie, OIF, the Commonwealth Secretariat, the Organisation of American States, OAS, and the Asia African Legal Consultative Organisation to promote principles of international criminal law. Indeed, I am very glad for this opportunity offered by the uh, St. Petersburg International Legal Forum to engage in a professional exchange with old friends as well as some new. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I conclude my own introductory remarks and I would like uh, to now make a way for the distinguished uh, panelists. The first panelist is uh, Mr. Alexei Alexandrov. Right? Did I pronounce the name correctly? Is the senator on the Council of Federation of the Federal Assembly of Russian Federation. 
Mr. Alexandrov, the floor is yours. Спасибо, господин председатель. Very much, Mr. Ch Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You pronounced my name exactly as it sounds. I would like to say a few introductory words uh, on a rather crucial topic, a topic that has brought us all together here. I'm a professor at the St. Petersburg State University. I deal with uh, various aspects of criminal proceedings as well as criminal crimes policy. For 25 years, I have been a member of the Russian parliament. For, the, for 10 years, I dealt with these issues in the State Duma, and uh, for about 10 years, I have also been a member of the Council of the Federation of the Federal Assembly. I would like to share with you a few sincere thoughts about the challenges to the criminal policy that we are facing. I would like to share with you some aspects which I believe are indispensable, crucial for the future world. I believe that the aspects that we are discussing here at the round table are probably the most important for the legal forum. We have a lot of round tables running around uh, civil legislation, economics, banking regulations. But uh, right after the perestroika in Russia, uh, the most needed lawyers uh, in Russia became the so-called civilists, whereas experts uh, in international criminal law, experts in criminal law, uh, stepped into the background. They were left in the background because the focus was on private property, market economy, and it was certainly very important. However, when Russia started building its democracy 20 years ago, we seem to have forgotten that uh, no market economy can thrive without uh, vigorous legal regulation without uh, supervision and control, in that situation it will become uh, a uh, system of a misappropriation and very often democracy in those conditions will lead to lies and this is a cause of a great concern. Indeed, we're absolutely convinced that without uh, strict criminal responsibility within the state, within strict criminal responsibility for international crimes such as genocide, human trafficking, aggressive warfare, and other heinous crimes. No democracy, democratic system, no democratic statehood can survive. Our experience shows that uh, we inhabit a very small planet. And in my opinion, in this time when we're seeing a series of crises, financial crisis, economic crisis, we always say that humanity's future is at stake. However, I believe that the most difficult crisis that we're facing is a moral one and a legal one as well. It goes without saying that uh, law is going to save the world. Uh, rather than any correct or informed economic decisions. Freedom cannot exist without rule of law and observance of the law. Some time ago, people began to talk in Russia about uh, implementing a judiciary reform, about building a system founded on rule of law. I'm referring uh, to the middle of the 19th century and to the initiatives of our great legal reformer. That person's uh, uh, teacher, the great Russian poet Zhukovsky, taught him to love freedom because freedom is justice. Uh, uh, freedom is equivalent to order. We are currently um, debating very seriously uh, a new criminal system. 
uh, we believe that a criminal system is the relationship between uh, the authority and, the cr and crime. It is up to the authorities to decide what constitutes a crime and what is not a crime, what rules should be applied to prosecute crimes, what policies, uh, but sometimes uh, in the undemocratic governments uh, will question whether crime should be combated or not. Because a crime, in our understanding, is the pursuit one of one's goals, one's goals at the expense of other people's goals and well-being. In our opinion, criminal policy is very important. Uh, it falls into six categories. Uh, first, uh, criminal legal legislation on crimes and punishments uh, uh, that defines crimes and uh, the corresponding punishments. Preventive criminal legislation, and this is something that we have put uh, into the back burner. We pay very little attention to preventing crimes. Yes, uh, we're ready to respond to crimes once they're all once they have been committed. However, when bombs have been dropped, when children have died already, it may be a little bit too late. So prevention is crucial. It is the responsibility of the state and of society. Then investigation. The investigation aspects. You need to be able to find those responsible. Uh, for wrongdoings, uh, and uh, finally, criminal proceedings. The criminal process is part of the larger criminal law uh, that uh, sits next to material law. So in terms of the rules for investigating crimes, it is important to remember that we need not only to abide by the laws and by the rules, uh, but we also need to fight legally criminality and crime, so, uh, so as to avoid turning uh, prosecution of crimes into a crime. And of course, uh, law enforcement, as well as implementation of uh, sentences. So when people talk about human rights, and I have met uh, with the European um, Commissioner for Human Rights recently, and this is something I'm going to talk about. I'm going to also address the human rights aspect. That person asked me, what do you think is the most uh, painful problem in the field of human rights in Russia? And my response was as follows. I think our weakest spot is uh, pre-trial detention. The conditions of pretrial detention, detention of people who are entitled to protection under the law, but they are being held in inhuman conditions, first in a pretrial detention center, then they go to court where they are kept in a cage, literally in a cage, and uh, we still think that they remain protected by the law. You know, the right to protection also implies good health, access to food, nutrition, good conditions of detentions, plenty of air, plenty of light. People don't have to be sleeping in a cramped cell, smoke-filled cell, awaiting trial. These are aspects that we often turn the blind eye to. However, they're very important. Well, and certainly organization of the criminal system is also important. Uh, by organization, I mean criminal uh, culture, criminal science, human resources policy with respect to the law enforcement, as well as the judiciary. It is very important who prosecutes. It is important who presides in court. It is important who carries out law enforcement functions, the integrity of uh, law enforcement officers, how competent and how capable are they of judging other people. And it also has to do with the issue of confidence in the criminal system. And legal education is another all-important aspect. Yesterday we talked about that in a separate session, and it certainly merits uh, a separate discussion. So as you see, all aspects that I have touched upon are indispensable for an effective criminal policy in a, in a country, in a state, or internationally. I already noticed 
already mentioned that uh, uh, countries, states are very close to each other. It's a small world, so international crimes uh, is also something that uh, brings us together. We all depend on the morality and the principled stance of our leaders, and this is also very important. How principled are our leadership? Uh, are moral principles for them superior to economic or material interests? Uh, another issue that we see is the criminalization of international relations and uh, international links. A lot of people in Russia today believe that uh, money should be the first priority, and uh, that the means justify the end. Uh, the, the end justifies the means. Nevertheless, our criminal policy is built on uh, moral foundations, uh, nationally and internationally recognized uh, moral principles and rules. So not only do we support the international criminal court in his or her proceedings, we are prepared to increase its credibility and contribute to its work. The activities of the International Criminal Court should be known more widely in various countries because it helps build trust and credibility. Focus should be not only on uh, civil and commercial dispute settlements, uh, our focus should also be on these aspects, otherwise we risk uh, uh, throwing out the child with the bathwater. However, as far as this country con is concerned, uh, uh, I would like to focus on the specific challenges that Russia is facing. Very often, people criticize Russia for violating human rights. For many years, I have been a member of the Interparliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe in Strasbourg. So recently, I have come under a lot of criticism. However, very often, these allegations miss the point, really. For instance, there was a case on the deprivation of liberty of a group of uh, young women who entered a Russian Orthodox Church and uh, opposed uh, in front of the altar. Um, uh, showing obscene gestures uh, and uh, offending millions of uh, Russian Christians. It was on that particular case that we heard a lot of criticism, um, recalling human rights, invoking human rights violations. We just don't understand why we are being criticized, because we are being very open. We are ready to discuss uh, in a very transparent manner, our arguments, and we are ready to also talk to the politicians, because sometimes politicians only pursue their own agendas. They don't want to look outside. Um, this dialogue could be continued with uh, Mr. Strauss-Kahn, Mr. Uh, Jacques Chirac, um, Mr. Moshe Katsav, because these people uh, came under very stringent criminal measures. Uh, even though they represented very democratic countries. So when we discuss these issues with legislators, academia, students, and other stakeholders, very often our position is not understood. And when we deal with cases that uh, are not very widely uh, discussed in this country, because, you know, uh, the attitudes are different in different countries. And when we deal with people, or with the cases of people who were brought to justice uh, years after uh, their alleged crimes, we remember the case of uh, a janitor who was, uh, who became a, a convent, a convict, uh, we remember that case of a janitor in an American hotel when a cleaner was accused, uh, when a cleaner accused the minister. 
there is a number of cases that are very high profile that are being discussed out there in the street, and they will certainly deserve uh, the attention of uh, lawyers and jurists. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, we find questionable allegations of aggressive policies uh, of some countries. Um, uh, there were five million victims uh, as a result of the U.S. invasion in Iraq. Uh, those people could have had children, could have had families. What was the overall purpose? What was the overall go goal? We still haven't heard about that. Another subject, uh, secret detention centers in Europe sanctioned torture by security forces of some democratic states. Recently, we have been shocked by a chain of events, and there was a certain response, no matter what you think about this, uh, by the Russian parliament to the Magnitsky list legislation adopted in the U.S. Uh, what actually happened was uh, one country blacklisted citizens of another country without uh, observing the principle of presumption of innocence, uh, and uh, the list that was adopted uh, was secret, uh, and the measures uh, against those persons were not specified. Uh, again, what measures could they be talking about? Could that be torture? Could that be defamation? And very Often people shun these topics. Uh, in my opinion, this has nothing to do with the uh, rule of law, and it also erodes uh, the moral foundations, the legal moral foundations, uh, as well as uh, the legal confidence that people have in each other in various countries. Uh, it is my deep conviction that the only remedy for, to this internationally is to jointly consider these aspects uh, in a circle, not of a circle of polit politicians, but uh, uh, in a circle of lawyers, guided by scientific principles, moral principles, guided by common sense, as well as their understanding of uh, the history of law. I believe that history is certainly the most important um, subject for humankind. Uh, History not as a collection of facts, but history as a, a collection of lessons learned, what we have learned over the past 2,000 years. I believe the lessons of history can give us a very good guidance into the future, and they can be a life safer in many respects. I'm sorry for digressing a lot in my introductory word. We are prepared to engage in uh, a friendly and productive dialogue. We thank you for coming here to St. Petersburg. For us, this is not only a professional dialogue, but this is also a, an opportunity to engage in a human interaction. You know, in every country, the lawyer is a very special occupation because the lawyer serves supreme human values. I'm convinced that the law will save the world. For us, the law, the world, and peace are the supreme values that bring us all together. I'm, uh, I apologize for trespassing on my time. Thank, thank you, for your uh, comprehensive uh, remarks based on your uh, long time uh, experience. Uh, since um, it's obvious that uh, we are short of time, so it's in order for everybody to uh, make their own input within the time uh, constraint. Please be a little bit considerate and discreet in, in when you make your own uh, 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 speech. Uh, next, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Latif Husseinov, um, President of the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture, Council of Europe. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, for this invitation. Uh, to start with, uh, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to the Minister of Justice of the Russian Federation for uh, organizing, organizing this uh, marvelous event and for inviting me uh, to take part in the forum and to make a presentation. 
This is indeed an excellent uh, opportunity for us uh, lawyers to come together and to have a professional exchange of views on most uh, topical uh, uh, issues. Um, and it's uh, indeed a great pleasure and honor for me to, uh, to be present and to have an exchange of views uh, with you, with distinguished lawyers. With your permission, I'd like to switch now to Russian. Uh, since I've prepared my, uh, my brief presentation uh, in uh, Russian language. Um. The selection of the topic for the presentation, prosecution by national courts of uh, tortures, based on universal jurisdiction. So the selection of the topic uh, was it mainly explained by the mandate of the body that I represent, the European Committee on the Prevention of Torture? This is the body which is one of the most efficient mechanisms that helps to fight torture and other inhumane uh, acts against humans. As you can see from the name of the committee, it is not on its own a judiciary body. We do not look into complaints. We are a preventative mechanism. And our mandate is to visit regularly different detention centers in order to conduct inspections and check whether the states, members of the Council of Europe, 47 states, treat prisoners in a humane manner. However, we are also capable of providing an assessment of whether or not various states are efficient in investigating claims of torture. And this is a, a very important part of our preventative mandate. During the visits, we regularly check how competent authorities respond to claims or any other information. Our committee proceeds from the fact that the ban on torture has an absolute nature. And every time officials or enforcement officers that may be that are guilty of torture when they do are not prosecuted, this absolute nature of the ban on torture is undermined. We believe that it is extremely important to ensure the absolute right of every person not to be tortured. And the principal right in this fight belongs to the national law, because everywhere torture is accepted as a serious criminal offense, similar serious crime, but it is also an international crime. The civil criminal mechanism provides for two main measures against torture. First is international courts, including hybrid bodies, such as specialized courts in Sierra Leone. And the second mechanism, the national courts, which apply different laws, and since we're talking about international crimes, they can also apply the universal jurisdiction. And the famous principle of our deadly out Deteriorate. And uh, it is important that the International Criminal Court 
and we know that it has certain temporal limited temporal jurisdiction because it uh, can only pursue those crimes that uh, occurred before the Roman statute w w came into force and in some cases ad hoc tribunals are set up. There are a number of political issues that may come as obstacles to help uh, different countries, uh, the states that are members of the UN or even the members of the Council of the uh, Security Council to bring someone to justice and extradite to a different country. We know that torture as a single act does not come under the jurisdiction of the international criminal law. Torture can be investigated only when it becomes when it is considered to be an act against civilians a mass attack against civilians that is There is an opinion holding that some crimes can be prosecuted under international common law and that irrespective of where the torture was uh, conducted and who conducted it, the place, in, in, regardless of the place and the agent of torture, they, the crime falls under the international rather universal jurisdiction. Some believe that it is not just the right, but the duty of every government to prosecute torture. However, this is not seen, uh, th this is not a very widely accepted point of view. If you look at the national process, proceedings against torture, uh, that's uh, where torture was uh, conducted against a citizen of a country or was conducted by a citizen of a country, or if there is a direct link between the act of torture and the specific state, the so-called pr protective jurisdiction, then everything is clear. But when there are no links, we still can have uh, such cases, and we have had cases in the history of international law there have been such cases before 1990s when these processes became widespread. We can say that those cases were isolated. The Ekman case, for instance, in 1960s. For a long time, there were no similar proceedings in any country. However, the legal framework was there, but for various reasons, the states were reluctant to apply this legal framework. In 1985, there was another case in Israel, 
And of course, I'm skipping intentionally some cases that were heard in different countries, especially those cases involving uh, crimes during the Second World War, because we're talking about the specific time period they here. But in 1990s, certain events took place, and these events became, gave an impetus to the development of international criminal law. They reminded different states that all states have national legislation as well as the international law that gives them tools to efficiently prosecute impunity. It was important to prove to the states that it is in their national interest that people who conduct torture are enemies of all states. The circle of uh, the perpetrators has now widened up. We include not only pirates, but other criminals. Other criminals who perform cruel crimes, and they can be prosecuted not only by ad hoc tribunals, but also by permanent international courts. And the president of one of such international courts is present here today. So the states, one by one, start adopting relevant legislation that would give them very clear tools and mechanisms. However, as I said earlier, uh, the framework was already there. And uh, we could also apply the Convention on Genocide here. The author's position was that genocide is a crime that should be uh, to take this principle into the legislation. Unfortunately, wars and conflicts are the events that trigger the development of international law, and especially international criminal law. In a way, the international law follows the events. It does not prevent them from happening. So we had to have Yugoslavia, we had to have Rwanda for the states to remember that universal jurisdiction was there for them to use. Obviously, the international tribunals assisted states here, especially the International Tribunal for Former Yugoslavia. In fact, some believe And the president may agree or disagree. Some believe that the tribunal for former Yugoslavia went even further than other people believed it would go in the Frunze state, uh, case. 
Euroscoggins, it's a very uh, clear case that the prohibition of torture creates certain obligations for all states. And all states can use the national uh, legislation in order to prosecute uh, torturers. And the immunity is not recognized by any state. Uh, I understand that we do not have much time. I will finish in a few moments. But I think there may be a problem here. What I said earlier is something very clear. It's all, everything exists on paper. It's all part of the law. We all recognize that. It's either in the contract law or in the common law, or we can see it's in case law, but there still is a problem. We understand that there is such a notion as uh, a judicial imperialism. It exists, nobody can deny that. Obviously, torture is uh, an international crime. And we have to understand that the universal jurisdiction comes into contradiction with the judicial imperialism. The second point is political pressure. We all remember what happened in Belgium. Belgium used the 1991 law, and it brought charges against Sharon Arafat, Bush, Colin Powell, Cheney, and others. And the Americans said that they would not want to fund NATO any longer, that the NATO headquarters should be removed from Belgium. And only then, Brussels stopped. So it wasn't enough to have an arrest warrant. It was a decision pressured by political forces. Unfortunately, I do not have time to elaborate on these interesting topics, but I would be happy to answer your questions. I hope I will be able to explain more when I answer questions. Just one more thing. The principle of universal jurisdiction has the right to lo for life if we have the principle of legality and the principle of fair trial, legal definiteness, then this principle should be applied and it should be applied in a useful way so that we could fight impunity together. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, for your uh, highly informative presentation on the national and international uh, aspects of the uh, crime of torture. Now, uh, I have a uh, pleasure uh, to give the floor to my colleague, Judge uh, Ted Meron, President of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former U.S. law and criminal law are possible 
and that they are feasible. Uh, we have proved to be a very important trailblazer because uh, we also showed that when in the Security Council there was cooperation in 1993 between Russia and my own country, the United States, it was possible to agree on the establishment of an international criminal tribunal just as in the aftermath of the Second World War cooperation between the Soviet Union and the United States and of course other countries made the establishment of the Nuremberg Tribunal possible. But so while we were in many respects a trailblazer or a pioneer, we owe a great deal to the IMT, International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg, and I would like now to speak about its role. As you may know and remember, the Tribunal IMT was established following the London Charter, an agreement reached in August 1945 among France, the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, and the United States, and the Charter established three basic crimes, uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and crimes against peace. As you know, the crime of genocide has not yet been recognized. Now, the tribunal, IMT, was responsible for groundbreaking advances in international law, both as an institution and because of its jurisprudence, and many of these advances were quite critical in shaping the form of new modern international criminal law. And I would like now to say something about the context and the role of the Soviet Union. Now, to understand the origins of the Nuremberg Tribunal, we must remember the magnitude of the tragedy that preceded it the scope of the cruelty, the devastation, the loss of life visited on all sides of the conflict, especially in your own country, was staggering. In the Soviet Union alone, some 30 million individuals lost their lives between 1941 and 1945 in what has been referred in this country and justly as the great patriotic war. The majority of those who were killed were civilians. And if the classic law of war was based on the chivalry concept of honor and the respect for the protection of civilians, these codes of conduct were seemingly quite inapplicable. They were forgotten by the Nazi troops on the Eastern Front. Indeed, before the commencement of the military operations, in June 1941, Hitler is supposed to have told his generals, and I quote, the war against Russia will be such that it cannot be fought in a nightly fashion. This struggle is...
Uh, and I would like to mention here one particular Soviet professor, Aron, Aron Trainin. He was largely responsible for revival of interest. Sorry? Trainin, I said Trainin. Uh, was particularly responsible for revival of interest in criminal law in his books, The Defense of Peace and Criminal Law in 37, and subsequently in 1944, his book on the criminal responsibility of Hitlerites. Now, among other things, Trinim called for the prosecution of Nazis, not only for war crimes, but crimes against peace, or as we call it now, crime of aggression. It was uh, Trinim's formulation of crimes against peace that had the greatest impact on the formulation of that crime in the Nuremberg Charter. But this was not the only contribution by Soviet doctrine to the London Charter. Uh, we often think that the notion, legal notion of complicity is a Western innovation. But if we read Trinin's 1944 book, we see that it contains a whole chapter on complicity and this had a major effect on what happened later with regard to the concept of complicity in Nuremberg. So the concept of complicity, the crime of aggression, and even perhaps the notion so important for criminal law of today in the daily practice uh, of uh, my colleague, the president of the ICC and myself, is the idea that senior officials may be considered the most responsible for crimes and that they may not claim any state or sovereign immunity. These are just examples of Soviet contributions. Now today, the idea of prosecuting someone for war crimes or crimes against humanity is um, hardly new. But in 1945, the inclusion of each of the crimes in the London Charter was, I want to remind you, highly controversial. Um, uh, and yet, if you look at the statute of the ICC, the statute of the ICTY, the statute of the ICTR, you see how much those concepts have now become part of modern international criminal law. And also crimes against peace, as articulated in London, have not been penalized under the statutes of modern criminal courts. The related crime of aggression is now a crime uh, um, over which the ICC, subject to certain conditions, might be able to exercise jurisdiction in the future. Now, the modern international criminal courts, including my own, have also been very deeply influenced by the sources of law relied upon in Nuremberg, and particularly by the way in which Nuremberg addressed concerns about the principle of legal
the protections for the accused uh, were much less developed than in later United Nations documents. And this was subjected to a lot of criticism. But I want to point out, in fairness to Nuremberg, that if, even if those due process protections were not fully spelled out in the Charter, fairness norms crept into the proceedings. And also the London Charter did not make an allusion to the burden of proof. The military tribunal imposed a rigorous common law burden of proof on the prosecution beyond the reasonable doubt. And this is, can, you can see from the fact that three of the individuals who were charged with crimes in Nuremberg in the major trials were acquitted on grounds of reasonable doubt, incidentally over a dissent of the Soviet judge. In sum, imperfect as the tribunal was uh, with regard to due process, uh, one of the enduring lessons of Nuremberg is that due process protections, human rights of the accused, are not an impediment to the administration of international justice, rather they are indispensable to it. So let me conclude by saying that uh, the military trials in Nuremberg were still, in many respects, a remarkable collaborative achievement of four different nations. And it is noteworthy that after 50 long years of inaction in the realm of international criminal justice, the establishment of the modern international criminal tribunals, starting with my own, was once again made possible by an extraordinary collaboration and consensus among members of the Security Council, including in particular the Russian, uh, Russia and my own, the United States. And thank you. Um, thank you, President Meron, for your uh, historical account on the development of international criminal law. Now I'd like to invite Mr. Mikhail Yoffe, uh, the uh, director of the Legal Aid uh, Center, Mos Moscow Russian, um, to uh, make a speech. Mr. Yoffe, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Господин Президент. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I am not going to talk too long about the organization of the forum. I just want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my views at this very important forum. I'd like to tell you about the practice I have uh, about uh, how I will try to protect the Soviet citizens, Russian citizens, uh, when they were charged with crimes against humanity, with uh, uh, other important serious crimes, uh, they were charged with these crimes in the form of in the Baltic countries. It was very interesting to hear about the International Tribunal for former Yugoslavia, but some of the cases I'm going to talk about um, unfortunately show us that everything is going in the opposite direction. I would like to give you a case of Mr. Kononov, which was heard by the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights, and I believe that the final decision uh, makes us question the lessons and the results of the Second World War. The decision taken by the Grand Chamber undermines the world order and the conclusions of the Nuremberg trial, as well as the legality of uh, killing the Nazi and their collaborators during the Second World War. For the first time after the end of this heinous war, 66 years later, the European Court of Human Rights uh, approved the legality and the justification of the criminal prosecution by Latvia of a participant of the anti-Nazi coalition. 
it is a very important case in today's uh, legal history because it makes it possible to prosecute veterans of the Second World War, the resistance veterans that live in the Baltic countries, and it ap applies law retrospectively. It is very interesting that originally the European Court had a different position, and on the 24th of July 2008, a different decision was made. Uh, uh, it was uh, ruled that the Latvian authorities applied criminal law retroactively, and the court recognized that collaboration with the Nazi cannot be justified. Moreover, the decision of the Grand Chamber was adopted against international regulations. Mr. Kononov was uh, prosecuted not for a general criminal offense, but he was convicted for killing civilians. And prosecution of an individual should be based on the recognition uh, by a competent international court the fault of a state on behalf of which this individual acted, and there were no such legal uh, justifications. So in this situation, we cannot agree with the legality and justification of the ruling of the Grand Chamber of the European Court. I believe that it is important for you to know what the case was about. And this is the history of the case. On the 29th of February, uh, February 29th, 1944, nine uh, residents of the village Malibazi that was temporarily occupied by the Nazi, a group of partisans uh, headed by Major Chuganov of the Red Army, uh, this group stopped for a while at the house of Mikula Krupniak. The head of uh, the group, Bernard Kimantas, organized guards to protect uh, the partisans, and he sent Mikula Krupnik to the German uh, headquarters in Goloshiva in order to tell where the partisans were uh, staying. In the morning of the 29th of February, the partisans were surrounded by the Germans, and three women told the Nazi where the partisans were, where they slept, and who guarded them. The brothers Kirmantas, Krupniki and Buls, showed the Nazi where it was very convenient to take cover in order to kill the partisans. And in the end, a group headed by Major Chuganov that consisted of 13 people, and that included two women and a, a baby, were killed. After that, the women took clothes from those killed, as well as from the killed baby, and the nine accomplices were rewarded by the Nazi with money and food. The partisans investigated this and realized that this group of uh, accessories living in Ma Mazibati uh, were accomplices in the crime, and the partisan tribunal convicted them and convicted them to death by a rifling squad, by a firing squad. On the 27th of May, uh, 1944, a group that included Mr. Kononov, a group of 18 people who were dressed in German clothes, uh, went into the village. They went into each of the houses of collaborators. They found rifles and grenades, more than 100 grenades, and other munition. And after that, the collaborators were killed, and the bodies of four of them were thrown into burning houses. Mr. Kononov himself did not fire at anyone because he was uh, born in the outskirts of the village. His parents lived in a neighboring village, and he was acquitted by the Latvian court on torture. In August 1998, he was charged with, uh, conduct, uh, with a, a crime. A, against the criminal code of Latvia of 1944. 
This case has been heard by numerous Latvian courts, and the original ruling of 21st of January 2000, Kononov was sentenced to six years in prison. On the 3rd of October 2003, he was acquitted of war crime, but he and he was, however, it was uh, ruled that he is guilty of banditry. On the 30th of April 2004, the, uh, uh, he appealed the Supreme Court and uh, he was sentenced to one year and eight months of imprisonment. On the 28th of September, the Supreme Court of Latvian Republic uh, upheld. upheld the uh, this solution. The uh, Mr. Kononov was imprisoned for more than one year, one year, eight months, and 11 days. In a way, we can say here that for the first time in history, Latvia says that uh, the status of uh, peaceful uh, residents uh, should be granted to collaborators of the Nazi who participated in killing of 12 heroes of resistance and the baby. So for the first time, a government upheld that it is important to change the uh, conclusions of the Nuremberg process. On the 17th of May 2010, the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights uh, did not recognize any violations uh, of the Article 7 of, the, con of uh, the Convention. It is important to look at the political and historic context. Uh, we can look at the uh, at paragraph 25 of the memorandum of the Latvian government of April 2009. The government means here the agreement between Germany and the USSR. Items 27 and 25 of the memorandum. The government uh, demands to qualify Kolonov's actions as a war crime on the basis that uh, Latvia that had been occupied by the Soviet Union in accordance with the general international law obligation to discontinue a criminal activity such as occupation of one state by another. Um, and it supposes uh, a restitution or a restoration of status quo, quo and compensations for damage inflicted. Therefore, the genuine purpose of the colonial process was uh, the intention of Latvia to condemn Soviet Union actions during World War II and to justify the claim for compensation for damage. It was not a declare. Uh, rather than a declared intention to comply with its international obligations for convicting war crimes. In court, we uh, reiterated that uh, Kolonov was a teenager during the pre-war years. He cannot be responsible neither for the agreement between Latvia and the USSR, Germany and the USSR, for the same elections in the 1990, in the 1940, uh, when Latvia voted for joining the USSR. However, when Latvia was occupied as part of the USSR, he joined anti Nazi forces. He battled against the Nazi Germany and its accomplices uh, uh, from among local population. Article 68.3 of the Criminal Code of Latvia, according to which Kononov was charged, reiterates Article 6 of the uh, Statute of the International War Tribunal and uh, implies liability for war crimes. According to the dis interpretation of the disposition of this article by all Latvian courts, the Mm. Uh, agent of the war crime is usually a combatant of the state, state that occupies the territory of another state. Therefore, the subject for discussion in the case law was, uh, in, 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 in this case, was whether the whether Kolonov was an occupant. Uh, Latgalsk uh, County Court, in its decision, um, indicated that an agent of war crime can be only a representative of the occupation authorities. Before 1944, the region was uh, under occupation of Germany, and Kolonov uh, fought against the 
occupation forces. So Kolonov cannot be recognized to be a special subject of the agent of the crime stipulated by Article 68.3 of Latvian Criminal Code. The Department for Criminal Cases of the Supreme Court in its decision of 2004 recognized that Kolonov in May 1944 um, represented the occupa occupation powers uh, uh, of the Soviet Union in Latvia. This is why he was uh, an agent of war crime. However, it contradicts common sense uh, and uh, cannot be uh, accepted. Uh, what is really important is that Latvian courts uh, interpret uh, uh, international law in such a way that uh, uh, a war crime agent can only be uh, can only belong to occupants. However, because Kolonov was not an occupant, uh, therefore, uh, criminal law, criminal war crime legislation is not applicable here. Uh, the war was fought not only by the regular troops of the anti-Hitler, co anti-Nazi coalition, but also by resistance fighters. Uh, without people like Kolonov, the um, European civilization, as we know it, the Council of Europe and the European uh, Court of Human Rights would not have been possible. Uh, Sixty years after. Uh, the events, Kolonov was uh, um, recognized to be guilty for leading a partisan troop. Uh, partisan troops, uh, the Grand Chamber of the European Court and Human Rights, uh, indicated that Mal Malibazi residents uh, had been captured by the partisans uh, and uh, without any resistance. Uh, the European Court recognized collaborationists as uh, uh, prisoners of war or civilians that took place, took part in warfare. According to their status, uh, they had the right to a fair trial and the right to life and uh, uh, to assistance. Uh, the violation of these rights was recognized by the Grand Chamber as a war crime. According to the courts, the partisans had uh, no right to attack the village uh, because they did not have uh, a tribunal. They did not have a detention center. I'm not going to quote from the um, decision of the European Court. Uh, uh, allow me just to say that the Liberal Code uh, could not be the Liberal Code could not be evoked. Uh, there were some other interesting conclusions arrived at by the Grand Chamber, but most importantly, uh, the uh, Chamber applied a finding from the history of qualifying war crimes as a provision recognized by civilized countries, which is not quite right. These provisions, these findings did not have a, an internationally recognized legal status. They could not be applied to Mr. Kononov. Uh, the Geneva Convention of 1949 was not in force in 1944 yet, so individual responsibility on the national level could not be invoked. It can only be invoked if a state has been recognized uh, to be at fault by an international competent court. Uh, this did not apply to Latvia. Nevertheless, they, were, they thought they were in a position to judge an individual. So for some reason, these political proceedings, politically motivated proceedings, uh, this time involved uh, the European Court of Human Rights, a respected international court. What the European Court does is it judges historical events, although uh, it has no right to do so, and this is being upheld by national courts. And uh, uh, let me tell you that this is not the only case. There are dozens of such cases when representatives of uh, um, uh, USSR, Soviet authorities, are, are convicted. However, this is against uh, international jurisdiction unless the international community has recognized the actions of a state to be a war crime or genocide or a crime against peace or humanity, it is not possible. And very briefly, for those who are present, I would like to also highlight a more recent case that is currently in progress in Lithuania against 81 Russian citizens for events that took place uh, on the uh, 11th through 29th of January uh, 1991 in Lithuania. 
What was the applicable criminal law back in those days? Um, unfortunately, for 20 years, Latvian authorities have uh, brought charges, just in, as in the Kalmanov case, against uh, uh, citizens in a retroactive fashion. This is why I agree with these previous speakers and with Mr. President here that jurisdiction should have an international character. We have uh, we are facing arbitrary actions by national courts here, whereby individuals cannot defend their rights. They are a priori recognized to be guilty as a representative of an occupying power. There is no such international provision in existence. Therefore, the international legal community simply must respond to this non-legal, illegal situation uh, in order to prevent the uh, outcomes of the Nuremberg trial to be reviewed and changed, because it seems that the Latvian authorities are not uh, content with the world order that has been in existence since the Nuremberg trial. Unfortunately, this trend involves not only national criminal courts, but also the uh, European Court of Human Rights that has upheld this collaborationist position this uh, illegal charges uh, which were brought against this anti-Nazi veteran. So this speaks to the relations that can uh, exist sometimes between national provisions and international provisions of criminal law. I simply wanted to highlight these two cases. Um, in the interest of time, I have to leave it there. I could not, unfortunately, highlight some of the conceptual violations that exist elsewhere in Europe these days. Uh, however, I am sure that the legal community must respond to these violations. Thank you, Mr. DOP. Um, I find you particularly interesting, especially on the relationship of the uh, state responsibility and the individual responsibility for international crimes. Now the floor will go to uh, um, Professor Lawrence uh, uh, Solan from the Brooklyn Law School, New York. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm honored and, and humbled to be part of such a distinguished panel and grateful to the Ministry of Justice for inviting me to, um, to this uh, very important event. Um, I'd, I'd like to, to begin by, um, by, by um, saying um, that I agree um, entirely with, with so many of the comments of the predecessors on this panel. I will speak only briefly in the interest of time because it's getting late but I would especially like to comment on Mr. Alexandrov's um, invitation at the beginning of this panel. Mr. Alexandrov's invitation at the beginning of this panel to engage in dialogue. The issues that are being raised here are, are of the highest moral importance. It is what makes us human. And the um, dialogue not only has to occur within the international legal community, which is um, because we're, we're dealing with issues that um, only law can solve. But um, I believe also that the academic community within the legal community has to be a major player. The universities are where the most open discourse occurs. Um, I'm here with my dean who's sitting in the audience, um, and Nicholas Allard, who's also participating. And we're both honored to be in a forum in which we can um, hopefully begin to engage in, in, in debate and, 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 um, and to share common interest and see how we can move them ahead. Um, we, are very, um, we will be very wel welcoming, of course, um, in, in Brooklyn, New York, where there are many Russians already, for anybody who wants to come and visit and, and to um, participate in dialogue. Um, there have been many comments so far about um, the United States um, actions in the beginning of, the, of, of this century um, involving the invasion of Iraq, involving the uh, criticism of American officials for uh, sanctioning what, um, what, a, what uh, seems to be torture to just about everybody except the people who engaged in approving it. And, um, I would like to comment that the, within the United States, as you all know, um, there is not a uniformity of opinion. Um, there are many people who disapproved of such acts then. There are many people who wish that the United States was a signatory to the Treaty of Rome. 
Uh, these are not, it is not a, um, a unilateral um, culture within the United States. So these issues are not only hotly debated, but they in large part led to an election of a different administration um, in 2008 with President Obama. Um, I did not come here to defend the policies of the United States at the beginning of the t 21st century with respect to the issues that were raised here. And I actually came to discuss issues that will seem smaller to many with respect to the, um, the issues of morality and, um, and universality that we hear with respect to torture and, and other crimes against humanity. Um, what I wanted to talk about very briefly is the position that the United States seems to take most of the time with respect to crimes that, transfer, uh, that transcend borders. And the United States has been both passive in some ways with respect to its prosecution of some, such crimes, but also quite aggressive in other ways. And I just want to comment on it very briefly now. There's a basic principle of American law um, that, that um, that crimes occur within the territory, and we don't prosecute crimes from outside the territory except in exceptional situations. Um, so, for example, there was an American um, convicted of, um, of firearms violations, of criminal firearm, of firearms crime in Japan, and he served many years in prison in Japan, and when he came to the United States, he bought a gun and it's against the law in the United States, it's a crime to buy a firearm if you've been convicted of a felony in any court. That's what the statute says, in any court. And the Supreme Court of the United States construed the expression in any court to mean only any American court, not because it furthers the purpose of the law to um, allow this person to own a firearm in the United States, but rather because there is a, um, a principle of humility that the United States will prosecute only crimes that occur within its borders. That is clearly at odds with the, with the overall tenor and important issues that are raised here with respect to such horrible uh, crimes as torture and slave trade and other crimes that um, evoke universal uh, jurisdiction under international law. So I would like to talk about a few kinds of crimes that are routinely prosecuted in the United States. And these really do involve the rule of law um, in everyday life. That is to say, it is, as, uh, it is, it is um, crucially important that governments show their disapproval through uh, the universal approbation of crimes against humanity, of torture, and of all the, um, uh, the issues that we've been raising here. But in, in some other way, it's also very, very important that we show our disapproval of the everyday disrespect for the rule of law that enters international affairs in such a way as to make it impossible for countries and for individuals within countries to proceed under a rule of law and, um, and as opposed to individuals uh, attempting to buy their way to, to, to um, um, privilege. Um, the United States um, does prosecute um, crimes of corruption by American citizens and others with respect to the bribery of foreign governments. There's the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, and it is enforced, and American uh, citizens are imprisoned for efforts to bribe foreign governments. It happens all the time. There are continuing prosecutions for it. The United States also prosecutes international business crimes. Um, and among them are um, the prosecution of international cartel uh, founders. There are several sessions at this forum on antitrust law, and um, there are no uh, victors in an international, illegal international business cartel for pharmaceuticals or for um, vitamins or for um, other things for which there have been prosecution, electronics and so on, except for the members of the cartel, that is the international community of consumers who would like their worlds to be uh, somewhat better, will not be better, but the cartel, um, the cartels will be enriched. The United States has been a, openly a leader in attempting to, um, uh, to get universal standards with respect to uh, cartels for the benefits of all citizenry. 
Um, the same is true with respect to other business crimes involving the securities markets about which there is not yet um, universal agreement. Um, the, I, I'd like to, um, to, to give as a final example um, something that is um, a, a quite, quite a serious crime and there's, um, there was controversy over it for some time, but now I believe um, there's much less so. And that has to do with terrorism and hijacking. Again, I am not here to defend the decisions of the um, Congress of the United States or the former administration with respect to um, setting up um, a Guantanamo or anything like it. Um, I would like to talk more about the routine prosecution of, um, of, of hijackers and the like. Um, this has been going on for 20 or 30 years. Um, the, um, the, case with which um, American policy um, began in the courts was in the early 1990s when an airplane was hijacked from Jordan and there were two American citizens on board and the, um, the hijackers were lured into international waters um, by a promise of, of, of the ability to engage in some corrupt activities and were arrested by American agents and prosecuted in the United States under a statute that says that when, um, when a hijacking occurs and there are Amer American nationals on board, then the United States will take jurisdiction. That at the time was somewhat aggress aggressive under international law, although not unknown, because um, the, um, the argument was made that hijacking was not considered, uh, was, was, was not universally uh, considered a crime under international law, and therefore universal jurisdiction uh, did not apply. Nonetheless, the United States took jurisdiction over that case and tried and convicted um, the individuals um, under the um, beyond a reasonable doubt standard. So my, my purpose in, in, um, in, in these remarks, which I will conclude now, um, uh, keeping my promise to be brief, is that um, we have had in the United States a, um, a, a, a diversion following um, the invasion of the United States in, um, on uh, September 11, 2001, of certain standards that we are hearing repeated here. Um, we invite uh, enthusiastically um, dialogue with respect to the very important humane and moral issues that have been discussed in this panel and which are so important to everybody here. And at the same time, we invite a discussion about rule of law values pervading all of our lives on an international basis in order to um, uh, bring the, the rule of law and the principle of, of legality um, into uh, the universal state in which it should reside. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Solan. Uh, thank you for this highly interesting presentation on some legal aspects of the U.S. national proceedings for the international uh, crimes. Now the floor will go to the last panelist, Mr. Uh, Frank Astill, if I... Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, it is a privilege to be here. I will also be very brief and raise two aspects for future consideration, I suspect, rather than present consideration. I'm very pleased that the Chairman said that the topic of international crime and jurisdiction covers a very broad scope. The first issue I would like to raise with you is probably the greatest change that's taken place in legal practice in the last decade which is the move of a lot of dispute resolution from courts to more private adjudication, whether that's arbitration, negotiated settlements or mediation. And while a good deal of the crime that uh, we have tended to discuss here today does not obviously reside in those types of change, what I would like to raise is that there is a whole world of crime, commercial crime, whether it's trafficking in cultural artefacts, arms, drugs, that I think is potentially susceptible to this dramatic move in dispute resolution from court-regulated procedures to much more private, much less scrutinised, 
much less evidentiary uh, formulaic, formulaic responses from judges and others with experience in dealing with evidence, I think there is a great potential for lawyers to become unwittingly complicit in resolving and helping resolve disputes that arise from uh, such activities, such commercial activities. And I take particularly the world of international commercial arbitration. Uh, as many of you would know, it has absolutely exploded as a field in the last uh, 10 years. Many arbitrators are lawyers, many are not, but it's a very uh, coherent, cohesive world, and it deals with an enormous volume of commercial uh, traffic, if we wanted to call it that. The second area, and I'm just leaving that in the air for the moment, because time is very short. The second area I wish to raise has to do with uh, education, really. And it follows on very much from what Larry was saying, I think, and what from the first speaker was saying in terms of the increasing need for lawyers generally to see the moral basis of law. And I think one area that we really need to concentrate on is a revision of law curriculums, whether it is in law schools or in continuing legal education, to put an enormous amount of emphasis on maintaining the rule of law. And it's not easy. It won't be easy to construct such curriculums. It won't be easy to infuse whole law programs with the concept of the rule of law. But we've heard it mentioned over and over again here today. It's not even easy to define. We can't kid ourselves that we can somehow in five minutes get a formula that we can spread to the world on the rule of law. My next comment is how do the two areas that I have mentioned actually merge together? Well, it seems to me that in areas such as international commercial arbitration, where they are based on model laws and conventions, we need a broad body of people reviewing such conventions and such model laws to ensure that those of us who actually work in those areas are especially sensitive to the potential, and particularly in areas of evidence, for shortcuts to be taken that ultimately would lead to allowing, or at least being part of, uh, a, a very serious privatisation, it seems to me, of potentially uh, very dangerous trafficking in the types of goods that I've spoken about. Now, I just raise that as an issue. The second area, the education area, again, it seems to me, is an area that demands a huge amount more than we've ever seen before, of international cooperation in devising curriculums which can be seen as common throughout the world and which bring out the common values that lawyers do have and do share as a profession. And if I might be a little bit indulgent for 30 seconds, my colleague Paul Monaghan, who's, who's here and is the co-chair of the Professional Ethics Committee, of the International Bar Association, has been working on some projects that exemplify this degree of cooperation, seeking out representatives from various countries to see how we can get a language that crosses boundaries, that provides understanding for all of us as to the central issues that bind our profession together, in a moral sense, if we can talk morals. And I think we can confidently, a number of people here today have spoken about how law needs to save the world and even perhaps a little bit less ambitious than that, but uh, we certainly need to be very, very conscious of our obligations as a profession in the face, I think, of not necessarily the heinous crimes that we do concentrate on, but that underbelly of other crime that uh, takes place day by day. And jurisdiction, in many respects, is everything here that can be used as a technical tool to subvert 
the actual bringing into reality a resolution that will solve a dispute, or it can be used to consolidate a universal approach to doing just what we as a profession want to do. And of course it is the latter that we need to emphasise. In conclusion, it seems to me that this forum is a shining example of the level of cooperation and the potential for cooperation that we have in these areas. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. For your um, uh, enlightening us. For enlightening us with the uh, new trends that are developing in the judicial practice as well as in the legal education. Uh, it is obvious that uh, we have no time for further discussion and Q&A, unless any of you uh, has a, just a burning issue uh, uh, to, to, to ask, uh, I would like to uh, just wrap up this session and close. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have witnessed uh, a very intellectually rich presentations in this session on, on one of the most dynamic areas of international law that has been uh, truly fast reaching uh, developments in the last few uh, decades. I believe uh, today's um, valuable input reflects broad international awareness on the need to ensure accountability for grave international crimes. Surely, all states and nations agree that a torture or genocide, as well as terrorism and piracy, must be stopped uh, for the sake of humanity's well-being and international peace and stability. But, um, our uh, presentations uh, have also exposed the fact that uh, there is still much work to be done on the international scene to achieve the goal. This is very much a developing area of international law and uh, many crucial issues still require close attention and tireless efforts to find widely agreeable solutions. However, one thing is clear. Sustainable solutions in the fight against impunity for the gravest crimes will not be possible without international cooperation among states as, as well as with international <coughs> institutions. Um, I pledge to commitment of the International Criminal Court toward these goals and uh, I also want to invite all of you to do the same. Um, finally, I thank uh, sincerely the distinguished <coughs> panelists and the audience and finally the, uh, the interpreters. Um, I, I, I hereby close this ses session. Thank you very much. <laughs>